Well, good evening, good people. Hello, it's 8.30 p.m. Wednesday evening tonight. <laughs> I'm just going to mix up my, my introduction up entirely tonight. <laughs> good evening, good people. It's uh, 8.30 p.m. Wednesday evening. It's time for another live stream. I'm Jason with Green Country Agriculture, of course. We got our gnome sitting there behind me, keeping an eye on everything, making sure we don't mess up. And the kitty is down here to make sure that she gets fed later on. We got Brian in the house with a super chat already. Let's be moonshiners together. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for the super chat, Brian. Uh, Vicky is in here. Many blessings, she says. Today, tonight, actually, we're going to dig into these boxes over here and see what we got. Uh, our pear tree is coming to ripe. I picked one a couple days ago. Actually, no, I picked this one yesterday. And I wanted to say something about pears. Now, people grow apples for apple cider, but per square foot, a pear tree produces more sugar than about, just about any other tree you can grow. The only problem with pears is a pear is only really good for one day out of its life. The day before it starts, the day before it starts to spoil is the day that a pear is perfect. I picked this one yesterday because today is its day, and I put it in the refrigerator to let it chill. I'm going to cut into this this pear here, which is well, I got a green screen on, so it's 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 kind of glitching a little bit up on us. But uh, we're going to cut off a slice of this, and the knife just slides right through that. Not because the knife is razor sharp and likely to cause severe injury if you accidentally cut your, or touch yourself with it, but because this pear is at that point of ripeness where it's soft, sweet, and will melt in your mouth. Oh my goodness, guys. This is so good. Hmm. So, a little bit of cellulose. A little bit of water, mostly sugar, on this pear. If I leave it out here, the bugs are going to come after it like nobody's business. But that's the, the risk we're going to take. So, Kay is saying, hi, hi all from Zone 6B. So, probably next week, your pears are going to start coming right, if they haven't already. Uh, so I saw that the pear tree was coming ripe and realized, oh my gosh, we're going to have to do something. They haven't been stolen yet this year. They got stolen last year. <laughs> and I really, really wanted to get some pear cider made. And so I went online and I ordered up a cider press and it arrived yesterday. I've got it sitting right here. I have two parts. I've got the, the fruit crusher up here and I've got the cider press down here. And I've got another piece of equipment that's down below that I'll show you later. Because we're going to do several things with the pears. We're just going to start out by first harvesting the pears. And then cutting them up into, into pieces. Running them through the crusher to crush them up. And put that pulp inside the cider press. Then we'll press the, 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 pear, the, the pear pulp that we've created with the, with the fruit crusher. Down to produce the juice. That will capture in some, uh, some fresh clean buckets that I picked up from Matt was just the other day. Because currently all the other five-gallon buckets I've got are full of uh, duck poop. <laughs> but we'll capture those in clean buckets, and then we'll we'll uh, put those in some uh, in some kettles on the stove to to pasteurize the the, the, the stuff the the, the the pear juice, and then we'll put them into um, some six-gallon carboys with airlocks on the top of it and a little bit of yeast, and we will start making some pear cider. So yay! Uh, let's see, Mary's with us tonight. Hi, Mary. Vicky's saying, European pears ripen from the core out. If they are picked when the skin looks ripe, they have ripened to rot under it. Yeah. Well, this is a Bartlett pear. So about the time that they start to get a little bit soft on the outside, they are, they're ready. They're completely and totally ready. And so I just cut into this one, but whenever they're ripe, Oh my goodness, guys. If you're buying pears from the grocery store, you're like, I don't really like the pears I get from the grocery store. They're a little bit too tough, right? They're, they're a little tough. They're a little starchy. Mm -mm. Riping on the tree. Best way to have them. And today is this pear's day. Oh my gosh, it's melting in my mouth. I take a bite and I just disintegrates in this delicious juicy cloud of of pear tasting goodness if you don't have a pear tree 
Mm, you're never going to experience what a delicious juicy pear is really like because whenever they pick them early and then ship them to you in the store they're not ripe and they don't get fully ripe because they have to ripen on the tree it's the only way you get a really properly ripened pear mm. <laughs> mm. and it's only good for one day tomorrow this pear would start to rot Today was the only day this pear was going to be fit to eat. And now I got flies back around my head. So I'm going to eat this pear. But let's go ahead and get started and take a look at the, the gear that we picked up from Amazon. And I could probably put the links in. Uh, if everything works out right, I'll put links in. If it works, if it doesn't work out right, then we won't bother with links. But let me put this over to the side here so it doesn't fall off on the floor. If everything works properly, we'll I'll put links in in the description once the video goes goes from being uh, live stream to, to regular, and then you can go get your own. We spent oh maybe two hundred and fifty dollars all together. That's forming around the the camera. Two hundred fifty dollars all together for this equipment, and we're going to start out with the grape crusher or the fruit crusher. This is. A heavy piece of equipment is going to fit on the top of a five-gallon bucket. And I can't see, so I'm going to adjust my camera angle here. This will fit on the top of a bucket. And you use this to crush your fruit before it goes into the press. And these are around about, you know, $135, $140, maybe $150 if you buy them separately. You get them as part of a package deal. Sometimes you can get a, a discount. That's what I did with this one. I got, I got a package deal where I got the the cider press and the crusher together. Boy. Let's see if I can get this thing open without cutting myself. Boy. Brian says, I'm going to get a beer. Break that open. I will I will join you, sir. Are you back? All right. Uh, this is a Oklahoma brewery called Rough Tail. And this particular one is called Everything Rhymes with Orange, although I'm pretty sure that's not true. Hmm. Woohoo! All right, here we go. They package this pretty good. I have to be careful not to, not to zap myself. All right, here we go. All right, we've got our instructions here. Here's the operational manual. For, this is called a grape crusher, but it works for every, all other kinds of fruit, too. All right. It says here, wear safety gloves. There's, there's a, some sort of a, probably the sharp bits. I might want to read this manual before we get too far down the line. We put the box with the sharp pieces over there. We've got some hardware. Uh, little screws. Okay, I'm going to need a screwdriver to assemble this. Of course, a manual crank. This is the manual part of the operation, right? So you can make cider even if we don't happen to have. Oh wow! Even if we don't happen to have electricity. Okay, I see the, I see the heavy part of this equipment here. So here we go. There's the, there's the top bit. I think the rest is just box. Okay. So. If I'm understanding how this thing is supposed to work correctly, let me go ahead and adjust the camera angle back up again. Wait, put this on my lap. There we go. All right, so this probably sits on your bucket. It's got a little, little notches there and there. And that supports this device, these little rollers. Once you have the... All right. Rollers are there. Once you've got your your handle attached, we'll feed the material down into the crusher. Wait. Vicky says I have some tree ripened peaches. They went directly or immediately into that dehydrator and candy jars just before they fell apart into pulp and juice. Man, that's the best time, right? That that one day, the day before they spoil, they've got all their starches converted into sugars. They will never be sweeter. They will never be better. And you will never experience that kind of deliciousness in your fruit unless you're growing the trees yourself. 
All right, here we go. So right off, I can say that this is called a squeeze master. This piece of machinery is very sturdily built. Everything is good, high quality steel, except for this part right here, which is plastic where the gears are. The gears are plastic. I've got uh, the screw that's supposed to go in here, and I'm probably going to need a wrench to actually do the, the fitting. And I don't happen to have one of the right size. I got a wrench that's not the right size for this, so that's just going to have to wait until tomorrow whenever we start shooting regular video. But we've got our our part that feeds the fruit, the fruit down into the crusher. Let me put this over to the side for the moment. We'll have a look at the. Uh, I'm going to lose my screws. Let's have a look at the the crusher blades here. It says, wear safety gloves. I have some. I've got some uh, Kevlar gloves for for handling hay bales. All right. So this is the. Okay. So here's the hopper. Parts the hopper that guides it down into the crusher. All this stuff goes on the top of that contraption, and you just—I think it, it holds maybe two or three liters of, of fruit that just feeds down into the crusher, so you can crush it. We capture that in the bucket. All right, nice, sturdy stainless steel parts. There's the sides of the hopper. There we go. And there's the other parts we've got. Boy. All the bits and pieces go together to make that fruit crusher, which is the first step. All right, let's put this aside for the moment and have a look at, at the cider press itself. When it's all said and done, it's going to look like that, and that'll just sit up on top of either your your cider press or if you're pressing ahead of time, you can put that on top of a of a five gallon bucket and crush your fruit down, and then press it. Otherwise, you got to do a lot of chopping and mincing. All right, there's instructions on how to assemble everything. All right, it looks it looks intelligible. We should be able to pull that off tomorrow when we get started. I get out there first thing in the morning and start picking pears. Oh my gosh. Ah. Manu gets a lot of work done. Heterodox says, Will that work on apples too? Yeah, actually, it will. Um, it's a cider press, which people typically will think, Well, you use a cider press to make apple cider. Well, yeah, yeah you can make apple cider, but uh, pears. Pears have more sugar in them than apples do. Boy. Just most people don't experience a fully ripe pear because you go to the grocery store and they pick them well before they're ripe. And they're just mostly starch. Okay, this is a little heavy. Oh, my goodness. Okay, there we go. So, we have a big box and a little box that's not the big box. Let's just throw that over there for the moment. So here we go. So this is the Squeeze Master. Is what it's called, Squeeze Master um, Cider Press. Put this down. Pear butter heterodox says, you know, I don't really like pear butter all that much, but I do like, I do like having some uh, some cider or some vinegar, and you know, you use vinegar along with a little bit of a little bit of oil in your salad. Mary ate all my vinegar that I made last year, and I made that from uh, from store bought juice. So this year we're going to make the juice ourselves. We're going to make the cider ourselves, and then we'll make the vinegar ourselves. So it'll be a one hundred percent at home operation. And oof, wow, this thing is that's substantial. All right, so here's the bottom. That's the bottom piece. That's what everything rests on. This little lip here is where this where the juice will come out whenever it gets pressed. So we've got our bottom. Put this 
sort to the side. And then we've got we got more bits and pieces. Let's see. The sides are made out of wooden slats. So let's bring this up here. The sides are made out of wooden slats look a bit like this. Um, right now they're bound together. I imagine whenever I look at the uh, the instruction manual, I'm just going to drop them in the corner. When I look at the instruction manual, it'll describe how to separate these out and arrange them around that base, which I'll just put over here for the moment. And of course, you've got the the top that goes over the top of that. We've got oh wow, this is a heavy that's a heavy nut for applying your tension. Some more blocks that, since I have not used one of these before, I don't know exactly what these do. Oh, this is going to be an exciting video. we <laughs> figure out how to, how to actually use this press. Uh, all right. This is the, it's the rod that you use to, to apply the tension with. This is the plate that goes. Okay, so that round circular part this would go on top of that round circular part, and then you, you apply tension and press it and make it go down using this, uh, this screw here. This package in there. All right. All this stuff is nice. It's solid. It's sturdy. Uh, it's either wood or it's uh, or it's steel. All right. Here's these are the. The rings, the hoops that go around that uh, the, the the wooden part of the cider press. And I can see it's got th these little hoops have got. Uh, I don't know if you can see it on the on the video, but they have. I might as well try unwrapping one here so you can see better. All right. So they've got little tiny holes there. I guess that's where the the screws that came with the, everything. The screws go in there to hold them in place. Put that on there. Of course, we've got a mesh bag that captures the pulp on the inside of the press. Comes with a warning. Plastic bags can be no, oh, okay. The usual. All right, and all the way at the bottom of that box. Okay, there's our there's our screws. We'll lose those. All the way at the bottom is our instruction manual, and that little illustration on the top of it shows us what it's supposed to look like when it's assembled. So, yeah. That looks pretty good. We're gonna we're gonna try pressing some cider either tomorrow or the next day. It just really depends upon when I'm gonna get it done. And the reason is I've got another piece of gear that I mentioned earlier that I've got to test out. And for the people that are channel members, you saw a little teaser trailer that I put out earlier today where I talked about animal feed, particularly feed for the ducks. Right now I'm paying about anywhere from $18 to $22 for a 50-pound bag of duck feed, which is fine. Um, but it also explains the cost of eggs. You know, duck eggs are about twice the cost. Wow, that, that is heavy. Duck eggs are about twice the cost of chicken eggs. And, of course, they're half again as large. And you have to feed a duck for six months before it starts producing eggs, if it's a female duck. If it's not a female duck, it's never going to produce eggs. Go figure. <laughs> but the question becomes, what happens if we can't get duck feed anymore for some reason? If the, the problems with the supply chain get to the point where I go to the feed store and they just don't have the duck feed that I need to feed the ducks. Or if uh, if they do have it, it's way more expensive than I want to pay for duck feed, especially if I'm trying to sell my eggs at a competitive price. What do I do then? <clears throat> well, I picked up a piece of gear that arrived today. I didn't expect it to arrive today, but it arrived today, so I'm going to show it to you today. Uh, that will allow us to make pellets out of just about anything, including Bermuda grass, which you have in, 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 in an abundance growing in the front yard. And I can also use the pulp that's left over after I've pressed the cider with this with the cider press so the pear pulp that's left over i can mix with dried bermuda grass 
and I cut a bunch today and it's been sun drying all day. So tomorrow it should be about the right moisture content for making pellets. And let me go ahead and get that piece of equipment unboxed and we'll have a look at it too. Hmm. All right. I know exciting, right? We got, it's like Christmas. All kinds of stuff today. Oh, let's see. You guys are talking about something in the chat. I don't know what. I have to, have to scroll up and see what's going on there. Boy. Yeah, it's the Mary the the the, the cider press that the inside is a is a wooden barrel that you do have to assemble yourself, and that has that mesh bag that goes in the inside of that that holds everything in, and then as you're just crushing the the pulp down to get the juice out, that just holds everything in place and lets the juice flow out that plate at the bottom. Let's see. Brian said, I have to buy chicken feed come Saturday. And Brian was mentioning earlier that the cost of chicken feed up there in Minnesota has come down a little bit, which is not too incredibly surprising. It's going to fluctuate. You're going to have, it'll be up, it'll be down. And depending upon what you're getting, it may be more or less easy to come by. Okay, we got styrofoam. And... We got another box inside of a box arrangement here. Some funky plastic packing material. All right. All right. Chasquez Red says his chicken feed in Illinois is up for a fifty-pound bag. So yeah, it's it, it, it's it's just it depends. Some places it's going to be good. Some places it's going to be bad. And some places you might not be able to find it. <laughs> ducks eat bugs and then ducks alone nothing and they'll be happy that's right that's right they'll eat the grasshoppers and be happy well i think is bermuda grass is anywhere from nine to 16 percent crude protein so if we use bermuda grass as the base for making feed pellets it's going to be anywhere from nine to 16 percent 16% is fine for, for adults, for adult ducks. Uh, the young ones, when they're still growing, they're going to want closer to maybe a 20, 22, 24, somewhere around that uh, percent crude protein. So if I was going to be making uh, a feed for uh, the young ones, the first six months, then I'd have to mix in a more concentrated protein source. So maybe press cake that's left over after pressing uh, sunflower or safflower for oil, or that's left over after pressing peanuts for oil too. And I looked around to see if I could find anybody that was selling the press cake from from a from an, an oil pressing operation, and I can't find anybody that's selling it. So probably they are selling it. They just already have their clientele established, and they they're not advertising that they have it for sale because they can they can sell all that they produce. Let's see. Vicky's saying, Katie, probably not as much demand as for chicken feed. Yeah, if we're talking about demand for duck feed, the demand for duck feed is a little bit lower than the demand for chicken feed, um, which is, which is, in a way, it's it's encouraging, but it's also discouraging because I don't have as many people competing with me for the duck feed. But as we've noticed with other things already uh, in this not crisis that we're going through at the moment, <clears throat> where you have things that aren't in as much demand, like different flavors of soda, they don't get produced or, or distributed as much as the more common or more popular variety. So if duck feed is not as common or as popular for most of your um, home gardeners or producers, backyard gardeners, then you may find it harder and harder to find it at the, at the, the ranch supply store. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Sasperes is asking if ducks eat crickets. Yeah, yeah. Ducks eat crickets. <laughs> they eat worms too. Uh, whenever whenever ours were young, before I, I, I got duck feed for them, I would uh, I would go and I would harvest worms out of our worm bins and feed them worms from the worm bins. And they loved those. And we'll probably uh, try to grow some more worms for uh, adding protein to the uh, to the duck feed in the future as we make pellets for, for duck feed. Mm. And yes, they love grasshoppers. All right, 
Here we go. Oh, wow. <laughs> Our instruction manual says meat grinder. I'm not the least bit concerned. Um, all right. So hopefully this does more than grind meat. This is marketed as a pelletizer for making pellet pelletized feed. So we've got our some various pieces here. I don't know exactly what everything does yet. So until I get through the instructions, I may want to hold on to all of this. So it does look an awful lot like a meat grinder. We've got yeah, this spot here, I guess, this is where the pellets come out. Let's have a look at the instruction manual here. Um, Mary is saying the instructions have better be in English. They are. It says tubes of meat or dough paste can be made with the kibbe attachment. Please observe all those illustrations. Under A and B, the kibbe attachment. I'm presuming that's the thing that makes pellets. So essentially what we have here is a, a meat grinder that can also make pellets. This is a little disturbing. All right, so where is the kibbe attachment? 7A plus B. Okay, where is, where is that? Ah, okay. So this thing, this thing here, this bizarre looking contraption, I guess this is what is used to make pellets. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> this is going to be another future video, guys, where we actually turn this thing on, put it together, and, and see if we can make feed pellets. For our animals with apparently a uh, let's see if that's the right okay that's a 220 volt outlet i've got our 220 volt uh, plug i've got an outlet that fits this in the back room all right so there's the guts of the thing is that it? 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 Okay. Put this over to this side. Well, this is an interesting little appliance. Um, let's see here. So the idea is after we get done pressing our cider, we'll have all that pulp left over, and we'll have dried grass. So we'll take the dried grass, Bermuda grass, which is already anywhere from nine to 16 percent crude protein all right and we will combine it in this contraption which will grind everything up and extrude pellets yeah. i'm sure this is supposed to fit on there in some other way i'll have to read the instructions but <laughs> So there we have a little machine that hopefully will produce feed pellets for us whenever it's put together properly and functioning. All right, let me gather my gather my bits and pieces together so I don't lose any. I think we want to start with trying to make some uh, some Bermuda grass pellets tomorrow morning. I cut the Bermuda grass early this morning, and it's been out air drying in the sun all day and hopefully that will be enough to enable us to to make some some feed pellets come tomorrow all right there we go got our grinder i wonder I wonder if I could adapt the manual grinder so that it can be used to make pellets. That would be interesting. I've got a I've got a manual meat grinder that if the thing is at its core, it's essentially a meat grinder. I'll bet I could adapt the manual grinder 
so that I could use it to, to, to work, even if we don't happen to have electricity. I'm going to have to experiment with that a bit. Okay. Put my, my knife back away. All right. Let me see. What do we have? Squeeze Master 5000. Vicky's saying, crushing the fruit for, for whenever we're, whenever we're starting to make cider, you got to crush the fruit first, otherwise it's going to be hard to get the juice out. Yeah. I mean, whenever the pears are, when the pears are this ripe, it probably wouldn't be too hard to, to squeeze it and get juice out. Hmm. Oh, wow. But not every pear is going to be at this particular peak of ripeness. <laughs> Mm. They're so good, so tender, so juicy. Mm. Mm. But anyway, Heterodox is asking, made in the USA. Um, what's made in the USA? The, the Crusher? Squeeze Master? Uh, I think so. All right. Let me see. Big says made in Oklahoma. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it looks like IKEA furniture. Yeah, kind of that. Um, Heterodox has got a good apple and elderberry crop this year. Never made cider before. Well, it's about time to to start experimenting. By golly. Hmm. Of course, if you're making if you're making a, a fermented elderberry, as you call it, elderberry wine, not elderberry cider, but you could probably mix it with apple. Sassafras reds in the house. Yeah, just need an ox to walk around in a circle, <laughs> around the press, <laughs> or a big dog, <laughs> or okay. Now I understand what Vicky was talking about. Or a politician in a squirrel cage. Give them some some sort of honest employment for a change. Kay is wondering why the duck feed costs so much more. Well, uh, yeah, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It's it's not as it's not as common. Many people have chickens. A lot of people have chickens, and essentially, chicken feed and duck feed are going to be made from the same kind of stuff. But. Having uh, having a formula specifically for ducks, although it's using the same basic ingredients, um, if it's going to be marketed for ducks, it's marketed to a smaller demographic, smaller group of people that are going to buy it. And because a smaller group of people are going to buy it, they have to charge more for it. It's all economics. The same stuff goes into it. Yeah, yeah, like I said, it's not as much demand. Sasquatch Red says my chicken feed is up to, up to sixteen or sixteen dollars for fifty pounds. Are we talking about the 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 the, the egg layer pellets, or uh, I hope you're saying I hope that's egg layer pellets and not fancy scratch. But that would be way too much for fancy scratch. That's just Milo and some cracked corn mostly. Makes my customers happy. Check out hot chicks. <laughs> yeah, if, if you've got if you got uh, your chickens running around outside, they can get all the bugs right now they can possibly eat. I know the um, I know the ducks are going nuts whenever grasshoppers land inside their enclosure. They chase them down. You know, ordinarily these uh, khaki camels are a bit skittish, but if they see a grasshopper landing anywhere nearby. They just go boom, and they don't care. They don't care if there's there's somebody standing right there or not. They'll charge to get it get it a grasshopper. Sasquatch Red says, "I want to grow soldier fly larva." That's probably a good way to get some some feed for your chickens. I wonder if you could grow the soldier fly larva, dry them, 
and uh, <laughs> grind them up and put them in pellets for, 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 for feed for later, too. There might be some uh, some potential there. I'll have to look into it. I've seen diagrams for uh, for bins where they have a little, little ramp on them, a little hole that the, that the larvae will climb up and they fall out and they fall into a tray and the chickens get to eat them. So it's pretty much just you put the you put the garbage in on one side and the, the larvae come out the other. Brian says he's throwing them celery and melons from work, making some happy chickens. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to slow second stocking up on chicken feed so I don't have to haul it around to back a homestead in winter. I've uh, I've got about four months of duck feed saved up, so I've got enough of the of the regular duck feed. Well, not four months for the ducks I have. I've got enough of the regular duck feed to get them through uh, until they're adults, <coughs> and then what I'm going to have to do after that will be anybody's guess, but if the machine that we just picked up works the way I hope it will, then it should be pretty easy to to uh, to make our own feed for them. And we have plenty of weeds. All I have to do is cut my weeds, and dry my weeds, and run them through the, through the grinder and press them out as pellets, and there we go. And all birds go crazy for elderberries. You know that elderberry bush that we were looking at the other day? Um, I've, I've been driving by it, you know, for a couple of days now. So, okay, fine. We're going we're gonna to get out there and have a look at the thing because I'm pretty sure it, it started to turn purple uh, sometime last week. And there were a lot more berries on it before. So the birds have been busy. They're, they're busy eating those berries off. Open oh, sorghum was going to do better than it did, but the wild birds got to it. I'll tell you what, we've we've been having a lot of wild birds coming coming by and and visiting. All of our sunflowers have been picked clean by the by the wild birds. The finches are coming out there and they're landing on it. And they're just going to town. I put food for them in the bird feeders, and somebody's going through the bird feeder and just getting in there and knocking everything out and onto the ground. And the finches don't want it off the ground. The, the, the goldfinches want it off of the plant standing there in the field. They don't <laughs> they don't want to go to a bird feeder. They don't want to eat it off the ground. They want it off the sunflower in the field. So that's where they're going. Vicky's saying, ducks and chickens don't have problems with chitin in their feed, which humans do. Yeah. Not really excited about the concept of having to eat bugs. I don't know that. Don't know about anybody else. I mean, maybe uh, maybe Nicole Kidman can eat bugs, but I prefer to catch fish with my bait. Hmm. Heterodox Santa, what if you could grow shrimp for them? Well, I bet you could. If you have a have a spot where you can keep your water warm and give it plenty of light, so the algae will grow, and the shrimp eat the algae. Uh, yeah, you can you can feed the shrimp through the ducks. Good protein for the ducks too. Katie saying her ducks seem fine raised on chicken crumbles with added oats and vitamins in the water. They do have uh, active bug hunting instincts, so yeah, they'll they'll hunt bugs, they'll hunt slugs, they'll hunt snails. They obviously they hunt grasshoppers, crickets, uh, little frogs, of course, little fishes if they you've got fishes in their little fishies in their enclosure in their ponds. I've got to get to work here whenever the temperature drops at uh, digging out a new duck pond. Uh, so I don't have to continuously work on filling up um, little waterers for them. I got another one of those, uh, another one of those tubs will hold about a good 15, 20 gallons. Um, so now I've got, I've got, a, I've got a separate tub for every row in, in the corn patch. So I can, I can, I can rotate that by and every week just, Dump, dump the water out, or every day dump the water out, advance the, the pan forward by another three or four feet, refill it, and then wash, rinse, repeat. And then we'll just every week the, the, the corn will get uh, one inch of water with duck poo in it. 
so they get watered and fertilized and all i'm doing is just changing out the duck water so the ducks are getting uh the ducks are getting their water and they'll be there present to uh to take care of the grasshopper problem to keep the grasshoppers out of the corn so next year's corn should not have as much problems as we had this year with uh with insect predation and they'll automatically be getting fertilized as I, as I take care of the ducks, kind of combining all of those chores together into, into just one process. And uh, so making feed pellets is, uh, is another part of that. Instead of, instead of putting the, the weeds out there and letting the ducks pick through it, because we've noticed that they don't really like the, the, the grass so much unless it's in their water. You can, you can take weeds, you take grass, you put it in the duck water where it's, where it's, where it's there with the moisture in it, and they'll eat that. But if it's just sitting out on the surface and it's dry, they'll pick at it a little bit, but they don't they don't really like it so much. They'll eat it fresh off the plant while it's still tender. So if you've got uh, tender shoots of grass, the ducks will eat that. But if you've got grass clippings or hay, they don't want to eat it so much. Uh, but they'll go nuts for pellets. So uh, we'll just take our, our, our grass, cut it, dry it, pelletize it, and feed it to the ducks that way. <laughs> Dope based. <laughs> Mary's saying maybe river prawn. Oh yeah, uh, river prawn is an interesting critter though. In their natural habitat, they they live in fresh water, but whenever they lay their whenever they lay their eggs, their eggs wash downstream, and they get into the estuaries right there where where the the, the rivers and the oceans come together. So the eggs need to have a little bit of brine to mature and hatch, and then they'll go back upstream. To, to complete their life cycle. Kimber says, hello from the other side, or from the other side of the, of the curtain there. Hi, Kimber. Uh, Mary's saying, I think they sent the wrong thing. Uh, maybe. It was Walmart. You got to be careful with Walmart. They might have sent the wrong thing or just misadvertised who knows i'll experiment with it and see if i can make feed pellets out of it if i can make feed pellets out of it then i'll be happy if i can't then uh we'll figure something out we could say most shrimp need salt water or brackish water the sun varieties or fresh water crayfish could be a crop eh, maybe um neocardia shrimp can, can can breed entirely in freshwater. Uh, most of your other varieties require at least partially uh, part of their life cycle needs to be in brine. Um, I think bamboo shrimp, which are a little bit bigger, about that size, are also entirely freshwater. But those ones require moving water because they're filter feeders. So if you've got a way to keep your water circulating, you can grow bamboo shrimp in freshwater. And those are kind of cool. But just the, the regular neocardia cherry shrimp, you can grow those in tubs. Uh, the same kind of tubs I've got guppies growing in out there in the, the backyard. Yeah, I guess I could grow guppies and feed guppies too. The guppies right now, I haven't fed them. I haven't fed them fish flakes at all. They've been eating a Zola. Uh, I, could, I could cultivate a Zola and duckweed and let the guppies eat that and then use the guppies... <laughs> As, as a protein source, and that might be a good idea. We'll experiment some more with that. I don't know if I want to eat guppies. They can get maybe about two or three inches, so maybe the size of an anchovy. But if you grow those as feed to feed to something else that you're producing for meat, um, maybe you're going to take them and grind them up and put them in through your feed for the ducks. The ducks lay eggs. And you have egg protein, which is a really good source of protein. We eat the eggs, right? So that's for us is asking, so do they have a manual paste extruder? I don't know. Um, but, but it appears that this particular machine over here is first and foremost a meat grinder, electric meat grinder, with an attachment that allows you to create pellets. And if that's the case, then... I guess my manual meat grinder could be used in, in a similar fashion, couldn't it? Hmm. 
Chewie says, cool looking machine. Why, thank you. Hopefully it works the way it's intended. We'll see. Uh, he says that reality shimmer on the right side of the screen is, is personally interesting. Let me see. Uh, right side of the screen and reality shimmer. That's okay. Oh, yeah. That's because there's you, you can see right off the edge of the, of the screen, you can see the bookshelf over there. The bookshelf and um, some matches and packages, packages, more packages. Yeah, Mary ordered a bunch of stuff too. Growing ducks and shrimp down in Gumbo Farm. Yeah, in okra too. I think next year I'm going to go back to growing that cowhorn okra that I got from uh, I got from uh, Arkansas Woodcutter Mark. Um, it was, I think, his wife's family out in Louisiana had been cultivating this particular variety for about forty for about forty generations, <laughs> forty years of, of the same okra being produced. It's a really, really nice okra. It produces very, very long pods that, that get long, get big, and don't get tough, which is the big problem we have with uh, with Clemson spineless and this this dwarf variety that we tried out this year. Um, Nice compact little plants, this dwarf variety of okra. But about the time the okra pods were about the size I want to harvest them and eat them, they got tough. Camera saying, be careful not to catch yourself again. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had a I had a little accident last week with this knife. So, you remember a few months ago, I did a video called, could this be the cheapest air layering technique where we just use the plastic bag and um, paper towels, moist and paper towels, and that was it. That's all, just the moist paper towels and the plastic bag. Um, not all of those have, have turned out. Some of them are, are doing fine, but a few of them, for whatever reason, um, the, 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 the limbs began to die on them. So I, I cut them off and I had to look at them to see how they were doing and maybe diagnose the problem, figure out what, what, what went wrong. And in every single one of those cases, whenever I cut the bags open and had to look, uh, it looked like mold was starting to develop on the on the, the branch side, the, the, the live side where, where, where the tree is on the tree side. Mold started to develop there. And whenever they started to mold, they, it, everything died off. The, 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 the cutting didn't take from that point. But as long as they didn't mold, they're still going. So, knock on wood, we might get some some trees out of that out of them that way. Even the ones that molded on most of them, they didn't mold until the uh, until the the cutting side had already calloused. And in a few cases, you could see the beginnings of roots forming. And it just because the the, the mold developed on the tree side, the tree wasn't able to transmit the uh, the nutrients anymore to the to the cutting, so that, that those wound up failing. But while I was cutting the bags open, I had I had the, the cutting sitting on my on my knee. The knife was open, and I was cutting the the bags, and I slipped and went zip right through my leg, or right through the pants into my leg, and and gave myself a nice little cut with this knife. It's very sharp, and I should have known better. But yeah. You say maybe a manual grinder could be pedal powered. Uh, right now, the manual grinder I've got is is, is hand crank powered. But uh, yeah, I suppose you could you could fix up a a, uh, a foot treadle and work it like that. We've got. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to say that we've got the foot. We've. Mary, is this is this is this a uh, sewing machine that we've got? Is is it manual powered, or is it? Uh, or is it electric? The, the thing that Mary is using for a desk is actually a, an old Singer sewing machine. And I don't know if it's manual or electric. I'll have, to, I'll have to open up the cabinet and have a look. It's a nice little antique over there. Uh, we used, I mean, when I was a kid, we used to have one. And that, that foot trail, you just sit there, doo, 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 and it spun the wheel. And if you had anything that you needed to, to operate with rotational energy, you could have hooked that flywheel up to it and run that. I really like that idea of just having machines that can operate off of rotational energy that don't necessarily have to have a motor integral to them. And then you can just 
attach whatever it is that you've got that can produce that 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 energy source to it. So it could either be a windmill or it could be an electric motor. It could be a gas motor. It could be an ox turning in a circle. It could be a guy sitting here moving a handle like this. Any, any way that you can produce that, it could be a water wheel. Any way you can produce that energy, that's what you need to operate the machine. These days, most of the machines we have, they've got that power supply, the thing that produces the energy or produces the, 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 the kinetic energy anyway, integral or a part of the machine and not separate from it. Um, but anyway, flies bugging me. They're all over that pair now. Okay, saying, let us know later about how the manual grinder works, please. I will. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take. I'll go ahead and take a look at that while I'm working on the uh, on the video for the for the electric, and we'll, we'll we'll see if there's there's any way that we can either adapt the parts that we've already got to making the manual work, or figure out an, enough about how it functions so that I can make something that would make the manual work. Because I'm really excited about that possibility too that. Maybe I can continue to make pellets even if the, even if something happens and the power goes out and the power never comes back on, um, which is always a possibility. In the the cosmic shooting gallery that we live in, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> Talk about Jess. <laughs> Hmm. Taught her how to how to, how to aim for pressure points, and she got she got pretty good at it. <laughs> oh, Maggie! Oh, oh yeah, Mag Maggie's 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 pretty good too. Oh, Maggie's one of those smart fighters, right? So Maggie is uh, uh, my friend Randy is is also also my sensei, but his principal student is is Maggie. And yeah, she's 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 a she's a she's a shorter gal, um, but whereas I, I will fight with uh, I, I will, I'll figure out what I'm going to do, charge in, attack, and then plow through whatever, uh, kind of like an ogre. Arr! <laughs> She'll sit there and study and, and and analyze and come up with a strategy to defeat whoever. And she watched me enough to figure out what I was doing. And so whenever I went through my usual routine, um, just typically would open up with a, with, with, with a low my Gary and then move in close and then be able to, to, to execute grappling technique up close. Um, she compensated for that and wound up uh, jamming up the, the bones in my foot because I hadn't fully extended yet by the time she moved in to, to counter that my Gary. So anyway. Got to watch out for the small ones. They probably have a plan to defeat you. Yeah, I was I was I was in the middle of of that opening kick that she knew I was going to do because that's what I always do because it's so successful. Um, Kim was saying, "Did I put them up before the live stream?" No, I did not. I have to go up. Whenever the stream is over, I have to go put them up. Let's see. Where you saying? I've learned that duck feet have little claws too. Yes, they do. Little ones, but they don't. They don't scratch things up the way chickens do. So, if you have chickens out there amongst your plants, the chickens will scratch up and they'll get at the while they're trying to dig up the. The bugs will scratch everything up and they can disturb the roots of your plants. Whereas ducks, although they do have claws on their feet, they don't really scratch. So they don't they, don't, they won't disturb the roots of the plants. They might nibble on the plant itself if it's something that they're interested in eating, but they won't disturb the roots. So by the time the corn gets to be a little bit taller than it is now, I mean, right now it's about waist high. And for a duck, it's you know, maybe a little bit overhead high, not it's at that point where if they decide that they want to jump up, they can get on top of the corn plant and flatten it down. 
So I don't want to let them out just yet, but probably in the next uh, couple of weeks, I'll start letting the ducks out into the, into the new corn. And then they can go to town on the bugs. But hopefully the, uh, the squash that I've got out there will develop to the point where the ducks don't want to eat it. But we'll see. If they wind up eating it, they'll eat it well. Just a little bit. <laughs> good night, Sean. Have a good one. I'm going to have to go out there and, and take care of the duckies here in a minute. Oh, I'm, I'm two pages up? Oh, my goodness. So Kimber's in, a, Kimber's in the spare bedroom right now. Kimber and, and her husband are in the spare room. Um, they just got the word in today on their on their homestead, uh, their, their, their new place. Um, the guy that they're buying from uh, has, has managed to, to, to hear back from his attorney because there was a dispute over over the, 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 the purchase contract. Uh, he's managed to hear back from his attorney, and it looks like that they will probably be able to, to, uh, to move in before too awful long. So hopefully by the end of the month, before winter gets here, they will be in their new place. Anyway. Kimber says she had duck eyes when she was seven. You didn't tell me that. Uh. Cardinals, swallows, finches, purple martins feasting on the bugs. I'll eat the birds before I eat the bug. Yeah, right. Although I'd rather have the have those those smaller birds out there working on the bugs, and then I'll have things like the ducks that we can raise for the duck eggs, and then um, I don't know if we get some drakes when we start hatching out ducklings, and and we get more drakes, then we can raise them up to about four or five months old, and then butcher drakes, and then have more uh, more laying hens or something like that. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, you can see the bookshelf yeah, right there. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so Vicky's saying there was a flap in the news within the last couple of days about humans with shellfish allergies reacting to chitin. It's kind of interesting. So it might be the chitin in the shellfish is what's what, what their their allergy. They have the allergy to the chitin. Hmm. That's interesting. So some folks aren't going to be able to eat the bugs at all. <laughs> oh, a lot of shellfish really, they are essentially ocean-going ocean forms of, of a bug, right? You know, lobsters and ocean-going cockroach is what they say. Injections also having all kinds of, yeah. Don't be an early adapter of technology. Okay. If somebody comes up with a new device for, for for recording and watching video on, they call it Betamax. It's going to be the next best thing. Don't be so quick to jump on the bandwagon and spend a lot of money on buying this piece of equipment. You don't know. There might be something better coming out next week. <laughs> Same thing goes for, for medical technology. Don't be the, the early adapter of the stuff. Uh, wait until you see what the problems with uh, with it are first, and then make the decision about whether you want to uh, to uh, use it. Oh, is that cheesecake? You guys want to see a kitty? Okay. We, we've got a visiting kitty also. Okay, yeah. Um, Suzu is going to get upset with me now because we're, we're, I'm, I'm entertaining another kitty. Oh, no. Oh, here, 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 here. Right, look over here at the screen. Say hi. Don't hi. Your computer. He will try to play with it. Hi. Producer, your little baby kitty. Hi. All right, here you go. That's why I didn't get to see Cheesy Cake yeah. while she was there. You go. He will actually let you hold him. Suzu won't let you hold her. 
She doesn't like it. Good baby boy. Heterodox is asking, what the best aquaculture fish is for Oklahoma, Missouri, Arkansas? Uh, catfish. Catfish and bluegills or some variety of perch. If you can get them flathead catfish, they eat nothing but live, but live feed and then uh, feed them on a diet of bluegill. So you grow your you grow your little fish, your bluegills and stuff like that, and the flathead catfish will eat those, and they, they don't do any bottom feeding. You're kind of a little bit turned off by channel catfish and uh, and blues that w- the way they like to, to eat off the bottom, bullheads too. Uh, the flatheads don't eat off the bottom. They only eat live food. So uh, if you can stock sh- uh, flathead catfish in your for, for your for your big fish that you eat and then grow uh, grow bluegills, for your feeders, and you can do things like you know grow guppies or, or mosquito fish to feed your bluegills. So your bluegills will, will eat live food too. Of course, catfish will eat your, eat your guppies as well if you're growing guppies. Uh, but all of that stuff is pretty good. Uh, have your ha- have your small fish like 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 mosquito fish or, or guppies to, to keep your mosquito population down in the shallows, where you're also breeding your shrimp. And then in slightly deeper water, you've got your uh, your, your, your bluegills or your sunfish, small perch, and then your deep water, you'll have your catfish that will, that will eat those. And then whenever you're hungry, you just go out and drop the line, grab a catfish, and dinner's on. You can also eat the shrimp, and you can also eat the bluegills. Uh, bluegills, perfectly tasty, as long as it's of a decent size. Whenever they're, you know, half a pound or so, they're, they're still mostly bones and not a lot of meat on them. But you get let a bluegill get to a respectable butchering size, you know, maybe two pounds or so. And then you've got a, a good pound of meat on them, and that's a decent meal. Mary's asking about river fishing. Uh, Brendan went out, went out and fished the uh, the creek that connects to the river a couple of days ago, and caught caught a few uh, caught a few fish and brought them home. Hi, Kitty. How you doing? Meow. Yeah. Yeah, if you let me pick you up, then, you know, it, it'd be a different. You're just going to lurk. Meow. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have any sassafras right now. I wanted to get a sassafras tree, and I have a neighbor that has some on his property, and I thought he was going to go bring me some. He just brought some roots. He didn't bring He didn't bring any, any tree starts. So... Okay, so I know where we're at now. <laughs> I was talking about the uh, the sewing machine over here. It's an electric. All right. So Brian, so you're going to make pear juice, and uh, no, I'm not going to turn it into moonshine, but I, I will. I will ferment it and turn it into cider, and then some of that cider will turn into vinegar, and then some of it will drink. But we, we won't. We won't distill it. At least not this year. Maybe next year. Once we've got two or three pear trees going, and we've got a lot of sugar to process, I might, I might see about uh, about running some through some through a uh, through a still and, and, and distilling it, because we could always use the the alcohol for for making tinctures and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, pear cider, pear, pear cider through a. Uh, through this through it through a still it'd be just fine just fine and dandy we got our sugar growing on trees uh mary saying it's not moonshine corn oh uh, yeah but i'd rather i'd rather use that corn for making tortillas than moonshine no, I'm sure I'll be. <laughs> i can use i can use the pears for making for making alcohol and then use the corn for uh, for making tortillas Ken says, hey, y'all, join the at the right time. Uh, <laughs> you missed the unboxing. Or oh, broke out the, the bits and pieces to the, this is the, the bottom of the, of the cider press. So you see how big that plate is. The, um, the wood slats go around. 
the outside. And then there's the press part that goes on the top. And then whenever you press it, the, the juice comes out, this little lip at the bottom. Now, this thing is pretty heavy. Anyway, I'll be doing a video here pretty soon where we go ahead and put the entire thing together and, 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 and start playing around with it. Tonight, we're just unboxing it, making sure everything was there, making sure nothing was broken. Um, can you make tinctures from milk thistles? Oh, I don't see why not. Let's see. I was not describing making, well, I guess maybe I could make some, <laughs> could make some moonshine with, with, uh, with pears. I don't have apples though. They don't grow well here on the, on the river bottom. You wonder if pond mussels are edible. Probably. Uh, you, you, you can farm, you can farm mussels. I haven't looked into it too extensively, but I've looked into farming, uh, farming prawns. You got about two, you know, half an acre or so of, of, of pond, and uh, you can grow pond, prawns out in it. They need to be bred in salt water, which you could either do in, a, in a, an aquarium or a tank. And then, uh, then the, the little prawns, after like maybe the third or fourth molt, can be moved out to fresh water and they can grow in the fresh water from there. Nanya Texas on the back 20 in the house. Good evening. Hi. How you guys doing? We're uh, going to make some cider out of pears here in the next couple of days. It's going to be fun. Heterodox is saying the chitin is picking up toxins from the environment. That's why people are having the allergic reactions to it. That could be. I mean, that, that may also be the reason why people have shellfish allergies is because the, the, the chitin in the shells of the shellfish picks up environmental toxins and they, they're responding to the environmental toxins. I mean, typically that's what mercury for the most part, right? Wow, how long ago was that that I did that that live stream? Have you had your mercury today? Talking about the the uh, uh, the 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 metal mining industry, particularly for coin metal, has has already polluted our our oceans with with mercury that we're going to be dealing with for the foreseeable future. And uh, that that stuff is out there; it's never going away. So we just have to figure out how to work around it. And also, you know, if you want if you want good seafood, if you want good fish and you know, good shellfish and stuff like that, you may have to to uh, to farm raise it instead of wild catching. Later, Brian. <laughs> oh, yeah, now I now I smell like a little boy cat, so she's going to come over here. And be all interested. <laughs> Kansas is originally from Southwest Virginia, not too far from Franklin County, which used to have the reputation of being the shine capital of the world. Wow! I mean, once upon a time, I mean, if 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 you wanted to preserve your corn, that's how you preserved it. You had to make moonshine out of it. Like you're saying maybe some bass for the bluegills. You know, bass are perched too. They're just big perch. Aw, you send me sassafras seeds or little or or little rooted uh, rooted saplings. That might be nice. I don't know how well they do here. I have not seen any growing anywhere nearby, and I seem to recall seeing them on seeing them on the on the slopes but not not in the not in the bottoms so i don't know they might grow but they, they may have issues with growing in bottom land or maybe they'll grow i just have to pamper them a little bit it's true i don't i don't have a green thumb <laughs> I just keep on planting stuff and hope something takes. Eventually it does and go, all right, there we go. We got that one taken care of. Guys are making some 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 watermelon hooch right now. Oh, that's gonna be good. It's gonna be really good. Hey, I think we're at the bottom of the comments. Silver mines, yeah. Silver mines, silver mines, and gold mines. Uh 
using mercury to process the metal. That's how he got it out in the oceans. And that it's 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 been there for thousands of years now, because we've been mining silver and gold for that long. There we go. Maybe put the seas on the new hill next to the highway. Well, it depends. I, I need to I need to get in touch with the uh, with the Up with Trees organization here in Tulsa, and see if I can adopt that section of highway. And if I do that, then uh, I, I'll have to make sure that it stays mowed and tended and everything else. But we can plant what we want on there, and uh, maybe to get away with having an apple tree or two out there, since they don't like bottomland either. And Heterodox says that I'll have a few elderberry cuttings to share in December. Yeah, the best time to take elderberry cuttings is whenever they're in their dormant period. So uh, after all the leaves come out, come off somewhere, somewhere around you know November or December or so, that's the time to, to take cuttings. And although it wasn't in the video because we had a, a truck passing by, a uh, semi truck passing by while I was while I was pulling out the the uh, the, the tape, I had some orange tape around here somewhere like you have I buy spools of the stuff for marking trees and stuff i pulled out some orange tape and i put that around the base of the elderberries so that whenever they go to dormant sage and i need to go find them whenever i'm passing by the area i can look for that little flash of orange and we can find those elderberries and take cuttings and then we can have some wild elderberry to bring in and start cuttings of that uh here in the yard as well the sambucus that i've got now is sambucus canadensis uh, various is negrum, which is black elderberry. It's a it's a black American elderberry, but it's 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 more of a uh, a dessert or fruit type elderberry. It's not wild, and I, I kind of want to have some of the wild stuff too. Mary's saying just put up a sign that says "Wildflowers planted, do not mow." I don't know the people that are being hired by the highway department. I don't think they necessarily know how to read. <laughs> they need a college education, which indicates that they probably have no no knowledge of how to read or any common sense. I think that's, yeah. If they're college educated, they probably don't know how to read. Anyway, guys, um, one hour and 12 minutes. Uh, so we've, we've taken out all of our goodies. We've shown them to you. We're going to go ahead and get these assembled over the next couple of days. I believe tomorrow I'm going to start picking pears, and by tomorrow evening I'm going to try to uh, make a couple of pellets out of uh, out of fresh Bermuda grass. We'll have had a full day of, of drying by then. Um, lawn service is not a college job. <laughs> Wild Canadensis zero chemicals. Canadensis, of course, for the people that, 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 that watch that particular video, is the, the, the binomial for anything that grows in the North American continent. So anything that grows in North America is, is called Canadensis. Sometimes you could also use Occidentalis instead of, uh, instead of Canadensis, which just means it grows in the West somewhere, uh, as opposed to Sinensis or Chinensis. But uh, Canadensis means specifically it's it's native to North America. But anyway, Canada just means North America. We all live in Canada. <gasps> oh no, Canadian solidarity. Hey. Mm. And I'd like to try some of that watermelon hoosh you guys are making. <laughs> watermelon one sounds pretty darn good. You can see in college no longer educates, but indoctrination, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. If, if you want an education, if you want a real education, you, you kind of have to go out and get it for yourself. Having somebody tell you what to think, that's not an education. Anyway, guys, it's been great having you all out tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Brian, for the, for the super chat really early on. Greatly appreciate that. We actually made some money tonight. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to get some sleep, and then tomorrow we're going to get busting at picking pears, pressing, putting together the cider press, pressing some some uh, pear cider, and hopefully making me some uh, making me some pellets. 
Uh, Nanya is saying, send me an address. If you have a look at the, uh, if you have a look at the, uh, the about section, you should find our address there. Or, or yeah, have a look at the website, uh, greencountryagriforestry.com. Right there at the bottom is is the physical address, which, uh, which is, um, I know a lot of people have PO boxes. Like, you want to send me something? Send me something. That's, that's the address. It's where we're at. Uh, if you want to come by and visit, come by and visit. Uh, make sure you you bring refreshments, and we'll we'll chill out in the grape arbor and, and chit chat and swap stories and play guitar and fiddle and all that good stuff. And if you want trouble, then I always need more compost. <laughs> anyway, guys, it's been great having you. I'm going to go ahead and call it a night and uh, and start packing all this stuff away. And getting some sleep because I've got a busy, busy day tomorrow. We're gonna we're gonna do some some more video shooting. I've got two, apparently at least two really nice uh, videos coming up on making feed pellets and on making apple cider. Or not apple cider. I'm making pear cider. You, you could always do the same process for making apple cider if you want to. Um, I still have to do a uh, corn nixtamalization video, which will be coming up pretty darn soon. Um, Brian is ahead of me. Cheers. <laughs> and I will catch you all next time. As always, if you found the video informative or entertaining, you know what to do. Until then, get out there and get growing, guys. Good night.